This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Well, that was really a really nice uh, introduction. I, I'm very touched. Um, <laughs> no, I like I, I like it when you know when people do mention that non. Um, typical trajectory to the PhD because I know so many students do think that there's one way to do it and if you don't do it that way there's the, you know you're just lost to the world I, I know that there was definitely a period of time when I thought I was lost to the world but <laughs> fortunately I, I wasn't okay so um, and I also just want to say how how pleased I am to see you all here literally as I was coming over here I had had the foresight to ask my chair to come to this uh, event um, but as I was walking over here, I was, think, I was saying, you know, Ramon, I'm really glad you're coming because I'm sure you're going to be the only person there, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, and this has a lot to do with the fact that, um, you know, there are two groups here at Stanford that I tend to think of as my constituency. And one is the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity, and they are having a fellows forum today. And the other is the Department of English, and they are having a faculty uh, student um, lunch today. So, uh, you know, this is what happens in spring, the, the tremendous overscheduling. So I just want to say how thrilled I was to come in and see people here. So um, let's, let's hope that I make it worth your, your hour. Okay. In a searingly powerful poem that serves as the fulcrum of her award-winning first book of poetry, Emplumada, the Chicana poet Lorna, Lorna de Cervantes responds to a white male acquaintance who has charged her with being much too concerned with the existence of racial discord. Over the course of poem for the young white man who asked me how I, an intelligent, well-read person, could believe in the war between races, Cervantes attempts to explain to the man why she has been unable to transcend the emotional predispositions and structures of feeling that have mediated her race-conscious perspective on their shared social world. Hers is a perspective, she contends, that has its roots in the emotionally toxic fallout of her everyday experiences of racism, the school year, schoolyard experiences that had left her with an excuse me tongue, and the nagging preoccupation with the feeling of not being good enough, the slaps on the face that her daily experiences of racism bring to her, and the powerful enmity she feels from the real enemy outside her door who hates her. In response to the young man's implied argument that any perspective that participates in race consciousness is the result of error-prone beliefs which can and should be eradicated through education, Cervantes insists that the accusation he has leveled at her cannot be adequately answered in the terms he has set forth. Racism, she tells him, is not intellectual. I cannot reason these scars away. Now I begin this poem with I mean I begin with this poem by Cervantes because by introducing the links between reason and emotion it allows me to open a conversation with you about what it means for me to be engaged with to be engaged by a work of literature. After all, it is as a teacher of primarily multicultural literature and of race and ethnicity that I enter the classroom. Ironically, Poem for the Young White Man is a poem that the poet, Lorna de Cervantes, has admitted is, a, is not a very good poem. And yet, as a poem about the psychic and emotional damage done by racism, and about the difficulty of communicating with people whose perspective is different from one's own, um, this poem is one that profoundly moves many people I know. Indeed, for a long time, I was not uh, able to read it aloud without choking up. Moreover, it is a poem that I have seen one of my very favorite Chicana authors, um, Elena Maria Viramontes, read aloud at an event for Chicano students. And it, is one, and it is one that one of my most esteemed colleagues, the anthropologist Renato Rosaldo, who was here for most of his career before he left to NYU, wrote about in an essay about the value of identity politics. So we might want to ask, what is it about this poem that makes it so powerful, 
even if critics of poetry might deem it to be not very good. Now this question is one that I have pondered ever since I heard Cervantes pass that negative judgment upon it at a reading that she did here at Stanford several years ago. So her statement made me wonder about the question of value and about what it is or what, how it, and how one decides what is or is not a good work of literature. The answer, I believe, as to why it is so powerful lies in the way the poem engages the emotions of those for whom it accurately captures something important about the world we live in. It represents accurately the difficulty of dialogue within the dynamics of difference, something that I, as a teacher of multicultural literature and of race and ethnicity, must address every time I step into the classroom. I titled my talk, Engagement in the Classroom, because it is when we succeed in engaging our students about literature, about race, or about single nucleotide polymorphisms, really, it doesn't matter, but when we succeed, when we, in making our students care about these things, that's when we facilitate true learning. Whatever our subject matter, Excellent teaching involves much more than simply passing on information that we already have to um, students who have not yet had a chance to get it. And that's what they sometimes call the banking model of education, where we make deposits, right? Okay. So excellent teaching um, involves making the subject matter relevant to our students' lives. It involves getting them emotionally involved with the material and creating an environment in which they can grow both intellectually and emotionally. An excellent teacher knows this and does this instinctively, but it is far from easy. Because engaging my students requires so much from me as a person, I know that I have not always been successful. On the other hand, I have not always failed, and that is why I can be here to talk to you today. Now, engagement is a paradoxical term. It is a term that we use for lovers once they make public their plans to spend the rest of their lives together as a married couple. It is also a military term that we use to describe those who enter battle, enter into battle with each other. In thinking about what these two situations have in common, I realized that engagement captures the ambivalence involved in being vulnerable enough and open enough to, this, to someone so that they might change you. Okay, now in the case of battle, obviously it means you're open and vulnerable enough that they could cut you up and you could die. But, and, and, and hopefully it's much less violent and more pleasant in the case of a, of a marriage. But, but, the, but the, again, it's this openness and vulnerability that is captured in this term. Education is fundamentally about the process of change, both intellectual and emotional. And so it is the link between intellect and emotion and the role of literature in mediating that link to which I turn now. Now Cervantes' assertion in the poem that racism is both imbued with emotion and resistant to pure reason finds resonance in the work of philosophers of emotion like Michael Stalker. In an essay about race and emotion, Stalker argues against the philosophical view that emotions only are involve or arise from beliefs. Okay, so it's the causal thing that he's arguing against. Such an account, he explains, undergirds the hopeful view that racism, or at least the emotions of racism, could be eliminated by changing the beliefs giving rise to those emotions. Stalker makes his argument by drawing on the work of Sartre, Sartre to trace out the intractability of feelings of loathing and contempt among anti-Semites who are confronted with evidence that logically contradicts the rationaliz rationalizations that they have constructed to justify their feelings. He discusses the futility of trying to change beliefs without attending to the emotions they are inextricably bound up with. Okay, and this is a quote from Stalker. It would not be enough that anti-Semites come to see that a particular act by a particular Jew is an everyday ordinary act or is even a fine act. That thought must be integrated into and seen to conflict with their anti-Semitism. And further, and this is the key point, this conflict must matter to them. 
It cannot be seen just as a puzzling anomaly of the sort that besets many, if not most, theories and generalizations. Nor can it be defended against in ways that stop it from mattering to them or moving them. They must be, and this means that almost certainly they must make themselves be, emotionally available and open to that thought and what I see as its obvious implications. Okay, so Stalker's point, I think, bears repeating. If the anti-Semite is not, at a profound level, emotionally moved or bothered by the contradiction between what she observes and what she knows, she need not make adjustments to her way of thinking. Even if she acknowledges that the act she has observed is a fine act, she can interpret it as an anomaly, as the proverbial exception to the general rule. And certainly this is something that any of those of us who are minorities and have succeeded have come into uh, come across as, well, you're not like them, right? You know, you're a good Mexican or, you know. Uh, or I, 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 had a, I ran into a situation the other day where somebody was, um, I was in New Mexico, and, you know, there are, there are a lot of um, conversos who went up to, conver Jew, Jews who converted to Catholicism way, way, way back when. And it's a good likelihood that most any, um, you know, Hispanic person from New Mexico has some Jewish heritage. But, you know, it's, it's fairly far back. But I, I ran into a man who knew that I was a professor at Stanford, and he was attributing my intellect, my success, <laughs> to that. <laughs> you know, which, of course, is a way of saying that it doesn't have anything to do with Mexicans. And you know, I wasn't going to let that go by. But it's, it's that same kind of, well, you're, you're not like them kind of thing, especially when one is a member of what is a denigrated racial or social group. OK. As such, without, without being moved or bothered emotionally by that contradiction, she can incorporate the act into her consciousness without having her anti-Semitic beliefs challenged in the least. Her emotional involvement is thus a prerequisite to overcoming her logically unfounded beliefs about Jews. So attending to one's own and others' emotions is thus a crucial part of those knowledge-generating projects that strive for more accurate and humane understandings of the world. While emotions are always experienced subjectively, the meanings they embody transcend the individuals who are doing the experiencing. Insofar as people learn from others around them what is considered to be an appropriate emotional reaction to any specific social situation, Emotions are shaped by the particular social and historical context into which they emerge. In other words, emotions are mediated by shared ideologies through which individuals construct their social identities. As such, emotions necessarily refer outward, beyond individuals, to historically and culturally specific sorts of social relations and economic arrangements. In other words, emotions are not merely subjective. They are not circumscribed within one body, even though we experience them that way. Right? Nor do they have their origin in an individual psyche. Rather, they literally embody larger social meanings and entrenched social arrangements. Thus, through attending to the meanings and origins of our often inchoate feelings, we can begin to discern the outlines of the social arrangements that sometimes constrain and sometimes enable our relational lives. It is in this way that emotions have crucial knowledge generating value, okay, because they refer outward. If they just were within us, then it's, it would be just you know, uh, navel-gating or narcissism to pay that much attention to them. So this is one of the reasons why I do think that, that uh, emotion is not a fuzzy subject in, um, in, that, in a pejorative way. It's actually a very important part of the learning process. In a similar way, literature can help us to understand the pervasive ideas and practices through which people in a given society understand their world. Literature, like film, like painting, like drama, is a formal representation that filters and shapes our interpretation of the world. A work of literature never represents the world as it really is, but rather mediates through a generic form, like, say, poetry or a novel or, you know, a, a, a play, the hopes, dreams, illusions, and sometimes faulty or partial knowledge of the author of the work. 
And because authors are products of their societies, those hopes, dreams, illusions, and knowledge are not unique to them. Rather, they engage, sometimes positively and sometimes negatively, the pervasive ideas and practices of the society the author lives in. So again, this is literature is valuable to us as a, an object of study because it refers to that world, not in an easy way, and not, I mean, actually in a very complexly mediated way, which is one of the reasons why it's good to have literary critics. That's just a plug for literary critics. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So literature is thus, thus best understood as a creative and formal response to culturally and historically situated tensions that express themselves at the level of individual experience. So I read and teach multicultural literature because novels, poems, and short stories written by and about people whose lives are different from my students' own can play a crucial role in changing and expanding my students intellectual and um, emotional horizons. Reading and discussing multicultural literature is pedagogically rich for at least the following three reasons. One, reading is a practice involving a person's intellectual and emotional engagement with a text. And I'll, talk, and I'll expand on all these three. Two, literature expands a, person's, a reader's horizon of possibility for experiential encounters. And three, Novels are heteroglossic textual mediations of complex social relations. Okay, so I'm going to get my water. Forgot it. When everything goes the way it should, a reader engages a work of literature both intellectually and emotionally. In the process of reading, she is called upon to participate in an act of interpretation, to actively make sense of the narrative and of the characters who inhabit it. After all, if a reader is not sufficiently engaged by a novel, she will put it down and stop reading. Unless, of course, the teacher has assigned it and she has to, but then you're not really learning, right? <laughs> so, um, if, however, she finds herself drawn into the novelistic world that is presented to her, her involvement will be both intellectual and emotional. The two processes necessarily go together. It is virtually impossible to follow a storyline or remember the details of a novelistic setting without caring in some sort of positive or negative way about the characters whose adventures and dilemmas power the storyline and provide fodder for the reader's ruminations about her own life. I mean, how many of you have read something and, you know, you're, you're always comparing yourself, you know, to um, a character, positively or negatively, right? Um, moreover, when we read a work of fiction, the potential exists for us to engage in a kind of world travel, whereby we enter into another and possibly quite alien world. A reader who takes up a book about a world that is far from her own will be exposed to situations, feelings, attitudes and characters that she does not encounter in her everyday life. Moreover, because books move so easily through space and time, at least relatively easily, we can read something that was left to us from Shakespeare's time, for instance, um, books allow those of us who live in racially segregated and economically stratified societies to be exposed to a multitude of perspectives that we might not otherwise be exposed to. Although some of us have friends from a wide variety of racial, cultural, and economic backgrounds, many more of us associate only with those who are very similar to ourselves. So, in the case of literature written by people who are different from us, the effect can be that we are pulled in and given access to a way of understanding the world that we might not otherwise encounter even if we live and work side by side with people of other races and cultures. Moreover, in the case of a long, complex narrative like a novel, the engagement a reader has with a text need not be of the trivial sort. It is true that a reader's engagement with a novel can be an encounter of the type that leaves her untouched and unmoved, but it need not be. And that's, you know, again, not, not all literature 
engages us, but it can. And, I, and that is what I think is the real value of it. The sort of engagement I am interested in here is the sort that causes a reader to profoundly question her basic understandings and attitudes. The potential for growth within the scene of reading and of discussing together with others a work of literature will not always be realized. Much depends on the quality of the reader's intellectual and emotional engagement with the novel and the fit between a particular reader and a particular text. This is because a reader has the power to control her exposure to materials that challenge her. She can take up books that are a good fit for her capacity for intellectual and emotional growth and refuse those that are either too challenging or that fail to offer enough pleasure to keep her reading. And I just I want to share with you an anecdote that um, when I was teaching a freshman seminar one time, which I really love to teach because freshmen are bright and um, fresh and they haven't been jaded and <laughs> you know and they, they still call you professor and they you know they're they're wonderful but um, uh, anyway I, so I was teaching this this freshman seminar called growing up in America which really looks at the experiences of growing up in America from many many different perspectives and um, and the first book I think we did was uh, Toni Morrison's um, bluest eye so how many of you are familiar with that novel so you it's it's a very uh, very painful novel about um, internalized racism and incest. So you can imagine it's not a um, happy, happy novel. And one of the, one of the young women um, came up to me afterwards, and, and, and she had been raised in, a, in, in the Midwest, and I think homeschooled, and um, in a very Christian household. And I don't think she'd been exposed to anything like this. And um, she, she was very, very sweet, and she came to me and she said, are all the novels going to be this, you know, difficult, you know, or, or this sad? And um, I looked at her, and I was mentally going down my list, and I said, uh, yes. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and she's like, well, why? And I said, well, you know, I, there's something about literature that kind of requires conflict. You know, a, a, a novel about a happy person can be pretty boring, you know. So, I mean, it was just part of uh, how it went, you know. Um, and so she ended up, um, she ended up saying that she was going to drop the class. And I, you know, part of me was like, no, you should stay in there and be exposed. And part of me was like, no, you need to encounter these things when you are ready, you know. Otherwise, it doesn't do you any good and, and can actually do much more harm. And, um, she, and she was so sweet about it that, you know, she was just a freshman. She will have time. To, uh, to encounter things, and it just, anyway. Central to an understanding of how and why literature holds out the potential for intellectual and emotional growth is a proper appreciation of the semantic open-endedness of long, complex works of literature like a novel. The literary critic, Mikhail Bakhtin, has famously theorized the constitutive heteroglossia of the novel form. According to Bakhtin, the novel can be defined as a diversity of social speech types, sometimes even a diversity of languages, and a diversity of individual voices artistically organized. Okay, so a diversity of individual speech types and individual um, voices artistically organized. It is the multi-voicedness he describes in this definition of a novel, a multi-voicedness that is accomplished artistically in any given novel through character's dialogue, the authorial voice, and the incorporation of other genres such as letters, news articles, poems, etc., all of which bring with them their own worldview that Bakhtin refers to with the concept of heteroglossia. Okay, so when I use that term, which I know is um, literary critical jargon, I'm basically talking about the incorporation of many different perspectives and um, uh, voices in, an, in a work of literature. So the novel form's constitutive heteroglossia is what ensures that any given novel will open out differently into the consciousness of its very various readers. It is, moreover, what accounts for the fact that the same novel will open out differently within the consciousness of the same reader over time. Allow me to elaborate. By insisting on its fundamental heterogeneity and multivoicedness, Bakhtin in no way suggests that the novel form lacks unity or artistry. He explains, 
The novel orchestrates all its themes, the totality of the world of objects and ideas depicted and expressed in it, by means of the social diversity of speech types and by the differing individual voices that flourish under such conditions. Now, through his use of the term orchestrates, Bakhtin implicitly and helpfully imagines the novel as a kind of linguistic symphony in which a variety of speech types, discourses, literary styles, and incorporated genres are arranged into a stylistic unity. Insofar as we compare the novel to a symphony, we can imagine the various voices, discourses, and genres that together make up a given novel as so many different melodies, rhythms, and instruments that sound in concert to make up an orchestrated whole. And just as the different melodies, rhythms, and instruments resonate differently for the various listeners of a, of a symphony, and you know, if, you, if you're a real listener, like for instance to jazz or to classical music, and you go and sometimes you're listening to the melody, sometimes you're listening to the cymbals, you know, uh, uh, sometimes you're key in on the violins, you know what I mean. So just as these different um, um, melodies, rhythms, and instruments resonate differently for the various listeners of a symphony, some of whom will focus on the melodic line, others of whom will listen hard for the bass undertones, and others who will feel a thrill of pleasure upon detecting the strains of an incorporated folk song with which they are familiar. So will the different elements of the novel resonate variously for diverse readers. The concept of heteroglossia helps us understand how and why a truly complex, multi-languaged, multi-perspectival novel will change for a reader over time and will in a non-trivial sense, be a different novel for different readers. This is not to suggest that any particular novel lacks its own intentionality or that its author does not have a meaning or message that she wants to convey and that we would do well as responsible readers to try to discern. Rather, the concept of heteroglossia shows why the meaning of a novel is not exhausted by either the author's intentionality or by the logic of the novel's plot line. Insofar as meaning only ever comes into existence through the interpretive process, it can never be absolutely fixed. So while on one level, heteroglossia must actually be there in the text, on another level, the disparate elements of that heteroglossia must be recognized and actively interpreted for meaning to come into being in the consciousness of an individual reader. A reader's experience of a novel will depend to a significant extent on her past experiences, her formal training, her cultural exposure, and the circumstances in which she reads the novel. So that's why reading it in a class can often be a very different uh, situation from reading it at home for pleasure. But now all of these together form her interpretive horizon and condition her readerly practices and expectations. And because people change over time, because they have additional experiences, sometimes receive more formal training, and occasionally expand or narrow their cultural horizons, their experience of a given novel will also change over time and with subsequent rereadings. For instance, I have modified my own interpretation of Toni Morrison's novel Sula several times as my attitudes about the dynamics of female friendship, the implications of marital infidelity, and the desire for security vis-a-vis -vis self exploration have altered over the years. I still love the novel. I still think it is a great work of art. But my experience of the novel and my judgment about its meaning have changed over the course of many rereadings um, in light of the uh, several significant changes in the circumstances of my life and through discussion with other people who have read the novel alongside me. Sometimes, as with my experience of Sula, a novel will seem to get better as a reader discovers ever new subtleties and meanings. Other times, however, a novel will get worse as a reader becomes bored with the thinness of the narrative or is newly offended by the themes and attitudes the novel conveys. And so we've had that experience, you know, say we watched, uh, you know, Gone with the Wind as a young person and loved it and then you know, grew up and learned stuff and go back to it and you're like, oh my God. So, you know, um, literary critic Wayne Booth describes something of this sort in his excellent argument for a serious reconsideration of the way literary critics think about ethical criticism. He writes, 
the very same Count of Monte Cristo that at 16 I thought the greatest novel ever written is now for me almost unreadable. Now the richness of any particular novel is due to a great deal more, of course, than the novel forms constitutive of heteroglossia. Much depends on the theme of the novel and the treatment its author has given to that theme. The best novels are those in which a writer of substantial skill, such as Toni Morrison, approaches writing as a process, as a process of emotional or intellectual um, exploration. Indeed, Morrison writes as a way of delving into a question or situation that she finds intriguing or troubling. In a 1985 interview conducted by Bessie Jones, Morrison formulated the question that motivated the novel Sula. Okay, I, if you haven't read it, it's a great novel. So, um, This is the question. If you, are, if you say you are somebody's friend, as in Sula, now what does that mean? What are the lines that you do not step across? Now, elsewhere in that same interview, Morrison explains that she views writing as a way of testing out the moral fiber of the characters in order to see how they respond to difficult situations. She writes, well, I think my goal is to see really and truly of what these people are made. And I put them in situations of great dis duress and pain, you know. I call their hand. And then when I see them in life-threatening circumstances or see their hands called, then I know who they are. Moreover, because Morrison regards writing as a process of moral and intellectual exploration, she does not write about ordinary, everyday people or events. Instead, she plums the hard cases, the situations where something really terrible happens. She explains, that's the way I find out what is heroic. That's the way I know why such people survive, who went under, who didn't, what the civilization was, because quiet as it's kept, much of our business, our existence here, has been grotesque. The process of writing a novel can thus be a process of exploration in which the answer surprises even the author. Now, um, Bakhtin focused his theorizing on the novel, which is one of the reasons why I have been talking about heteroglossia in, that, the, uh, um, in, talking of, in terms of the novel. However, his insights can be usefully extended to many other genres, uh, many of which have been, as Bakhtin himself notes, novelized. So in, in the rise of the novel, in fact, had an effect on other literary genres. And I think it is literature's constitutive heteroglossia that enables a reader to engage dialogically at a deep emotional level with the difficult questions around race, culture, and inequality that is raised by good multicultural literature. Such interaction can, I suggest, help our students to question and then revise some of their assumptions about structures of racial and economic inequality and how those structures are sustained. And while questioning does not lead ipso facto to intellectual and emotional growth, the former is at least a precondition for the latter. Now the Cervantes poem with which I began this talk demonstrates the failure of understanding that occurs when the engagement I have been extolling as necessary for productive learning are missing from a dialogue about difference, in this case, racial difference. The question implied by the title, and this is the question, you are an intelligent, well-read person. All such persons understand that racism is silly and illogical. As an intelligent, well-read person myself, I do not believe in racial discord. How then can you? This question introduces the less than ideal terms under which the exchange between the poet and the young white man is taking place. Because the young man's question implies a challenge to, rather than a sincere interest in, the poet's perspective, because he sees her with what the, with what the philosopher Marilyn Fry calls an arrogant eye, he begins the exchange by denying her interpretive capacity. He fails to extend to her the friendly presumption that she will bear reliable moral witness, and so cannot consider the possibility that she may know something that he does not know about the way race works in their shared world. His arrogant stance toward the poet 
is what allows him to make an appeal to their sameness, we are both well-read, educated people, at the expense of the racial difference that she insists must be acknowledged if her experiences are to make any sense. The poem, which is simultaneous, simultaneously an answer to the young man's question, is thus a passionate defense of the poet's race-conscious perspective on their shared social world. It is also an anguished appeal for understanding that simultaneously acknowledges the far greater possibility of misunderstanding. I know you don't believe this. You think this is nothing but faddish exaggeration, but they are not shooting at you. With this last line, the poet further demonstrates her understanding that the young man's social location inhibits, not fatally, but at least, you know, inhibits his ability to recognize the existence of a racial order that affects them each very differently. She understands that as a white man in a social order that overvalues both whiteness and maleness, he has never been targeted by the bullets of racism that are discreet and designed to kill slowly. So although she makes several appeals of her own that acknowledge the, her potential sameness to him, the poet finally refuses to uphold the young man's arrogant perception of their shared social world. To do so would be to gloss over the racial difference that shapes her very experience of that world. She tells him that despite her best efforts to shut out the sounds of blasting and muffled outrage that disrupt her poetic reverie, she, cannot, she finally cannot ignore the daily slaps on the face that racism unbidden brings to her. In a heteroglossic statement near the end of the poem that is at once subtly ironic and heart-wrenchingly sincere, the poet assures her young white male interlocutor, I am a poet who yearns to dance on rooftops, to whisper delicate lines about joy and the blessings of human understanding. The sincerity of the statement stems from the fact that she envisions a world in which the barbed wire politics of oppression have been torn down long ago and in which the only reminder of past battles lost or won is a slight rutting in the fertile fields. The irony stems from the fact that this is finally a poem about racial misunderstanding. Unless the young white man starts to care about the poet and her circumstances enough to risk trying on her interpretive claim and its implications for moral practice, and until he enters into a dialogue that acknowledges her as a worthy inter interlocutor who might have something to teach him about the world he lives in, the blessings of human understanding will remain frustratingly out of reach for them both. It is my task as a teacher, then, to bring enough of myself into the classroom that I have both the energy and the motivation to figure out a way to encourage my students to bring enough of themselves so that together we can figure out what a work of literature is telling us about the world we live in. And I say to figure out a way because it changes with every single class, you know, depending on how many students there are in there, who's in there, you know, how I'm feeling that quarter. I, I have to have enough energy and motivation to figure out a way. Only when we are all thoroughly engaged in the collective meaning making can a real dialogue across differences take place. And I will stop here. Thank you. So, yes, I'd, I'd be happy to take comments or questions or criticisms, whatever you want to send my way. Mm -hmm. And my experience is I'm told frequently by people of color that I'm not the typical American. Mm -hmm. And I feel both proud and shamed when I hear that. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious what your thoughts might be as a response to that comment. Well, um, um, I mean, that's interesting. I'm assuming that they mean that you're nice, yes. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, you know, uh, I think. 
I think you know how you would feel about that would depend a lot on how whether how you feel about a typical American. You know, I think when someone tells me, "Well, you're not like uh, a typical Mexican," um, I don't I don't like it because I know what their view of a typical Mexican is, and I don't agree with it. So you know, if I agreed that Mexicans were you know uh, lazy and criminal and all those negative uh, things that you know are represented out in the world, then maybe I would feel shame at that. But I don't feel shame at that. I just feel like I am. I'm just. I just, you know, I'm just here, educated, uh, instead of, you know, uh, not having had that opportunity. So. Yeah, I think the shame comes from recognizing that many Americans are maybe not that nice. Yeah. Sensitive to what's yeah. happening in the rest of the world. Yes. It makes me feel, you know, embarrassed to be an American sometimes. Well, you, you know, uh, at this moment in in our in our um, in the in history and in, in what our country is involved in. I don't think you're the only American who feels that way. Yeah. Yes? Um, students are often not used to having a space for yes. emotions in yeah. the classroom. And in order to create that space, what do you do to make them feel safe? Because it is really hard. You know, That's so atypical in a way. That yes. That they don't even see themselves as learners with emotions. Yes. Yes. Well, I, you know, various ways. One is by talking about it explicitly. Um, you know, because once you bring it up, then um, then you can explore it as an intellectual a issue as well as an emotional issue. Um, the other is by the material that I teach. You know, it's very hard to read a lot of the material I teach without having some kind of, you know, emotional interaction. Um, I find that. I mean, I do pay a lot of attention to the identities of my students not their ascribed identities only, but how they themselves see them, themselves. And, um, and then, you know, over time I've, I've come to understand that it's always best to approach students generously. Always assume that what they're saying, always interpret it in the most generous way possible. Um, you know, but not to be afraid to say, wow, you know, if you think about it that way, then this has these other implications. So, you know, it changes with every time. Sometimes it's as practical as, I mean, one thing that I realize other people don't do that I always do is, you know, I always have the students introduce themselves and tell me who they are, you know, if not going around the room. I mean, my first impulse when I got up here was to ask you all to introduce yourselves, <laughs> you know, because um, I, you know, it's very hard to connect people without having some idea of who you are. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot of practical ways of doing that. Yes, Michelle? I think you made a really eloquent argument, Paula, for engaging students emotionally. Um, I think one reason some faculty don't do it, though, is that they are afraid of the potential for negative emotion, either negative emotion toward them, toward the material, or <laughs> in some cases between the students. Yes. And I'm just curious. If there are ways that you found that, um, for example, by first having students introduce themselves and in that sense get to know each other so mm -hmm. that they're less likely to do something to another student that would be disrespectful. Mm -hmm. But I'm just curious about ways that you handle things so that even though the emotion is there, it doesn't get negative in a way that could be difficult to handle. Well, you know. It, if you're going to do that, it is going to get uh, negative, and it is going to be difficult to handle. You just have to be prepared, you know, and willing to to handle it. I think it, you just can't talk about. I mean, I like the introduction to comparative studies and race and ethnicity class. I mean, you can't talk about race without getting people riled up, and so um, um, you know, I I don't believe in the concept of a safe space in the classroom. Because that is just, um, I think, a little naive that you can make everybody uh, feel safe. Um, I, I, don't allow, I don't allow any student to be rude to another. You know, I will stop that. Um, I, will, I will encourage the airing of views and take I, all views seriously. But, but, but Airing them. I mean, I have a, an essay, um, and I'm just wishing that I could remember all this, all of this right at the top from my essay. That's called "What's Identity Got to Do with It?" 
and um, and that and I talk about some of the specific things there. But I think you know one of the best ways to do it is to anticipate this again by talking about it, by admitting that it's difficult, um, by you know say, by saying to students like you know nobody's a good guy, nobody's the bad guy. You know we are all implicated in this system. You know that it's it's how how we treat each other, how we discuss things. Um, and um, well, I, I guess I'll just stop there because otherwise I just I'm gonna blather on. <laughs> but um, but no, I mean I do have some suggestions in that, and I think we have to denaturalize students' own identities. You know, you have to get them to see themselves as not stuck in a place. You know, um, you are not only this. You are a person who can react and think and change. And, and um, that is very empowering for all students um, because it's when they think that they're stuck, like, oh, you are this, you know, you are a black woman, you are a white man, then, then, then they have nowhere to go. And so they're going to get defensive. And so one of the things that, like, for instance, Hazel Marcus and I really emphasized in our, uh, in our introduction to comparative studies and race uh, class is, um, is the, the fact that race is not a thing Race is an interaction, right? It's what we do. And so all we, we, what we have to do is understand how we do that and try to work on doing it differently. Any other questions? Yes? I have a question. Um, you talked a lot about kind of the importance of this uh, heteroglossia in novels and how these novels are going to resonate differently with different people at different times. So how do you, as a teacher, like, evaluate a student essay when you, you know that, like, when maybe the pers their perspective and their, even what they find as far as the meaning in a novel would be completely different from what you find. Sure. How do you begin to evaluate that? Well, um, I remember when I was an undergraduate, I wrote a, an essay on Jude the Obscure. Uh, and I was, uh, and it was a great essay, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, and it was all about, you know, Christian, um, salvation and whatever. And, uh, and the teacher gave me a B. And it was the first time I'd gotten a B on a uh, English essay. And I was just furious, you know. So I went in to talk to her. And she pointed out that in order for me to give the interpretation I gave, I basically had to ignore half the novel. So, you know, once I re you know, so that, so that was a very instructive thing for me. And I realized that, OK, so a student will come in and they're only listening to the base undertone. You say, yes. That base undertone is there, and if we don't, uh, and if we just focus on that, then this is your your analysis is brilliant. But a better interpretation of the novel might be one that takes into account as well the melody. So that that's how I, you know, helping them to see what else there is in the novel, and um, you know, I, but I also realize that novels are polysemic. You know, so not everybody has to come up with the right answer. There is no right answer. But it has to be defensible. It has to be a good argument. Anything else? Yes? I think I have one. Because um, I think that when you, you talk a lot about emotions and uh, emotions at the intellectual level, emotions at the base emotional level, and I think one of the, one of the most problematic things about um, entering into a dialogue about racism is the intellectualizing yeah. of emotions to the point where they no longer have any meaning mm -hmm. in terms of how you actually, how they affect you. <clears throat> and so that is a very, so you definitely want to treat emotions at both, at the emotional and intellectual level, but it's easy to, uh, it's easy to intellectualize it so much that it no longer has any <clears throat> meaning or a person is closed off to really exploring the the visceral effects. So how do you navigate that process so that you don't go into either extreme, and so you have something that's more productive? Well, um, I don't know that it's that easy to intellectualize to the point where, I mean, I guess I'd have to, uh, are you thinking in particular instances, or? Um, no, not, not, I'm not thinking about anything in particular. I mean, yeah. I'm thinking more along the lines of um, just 
various. I mean, I, I'm not thinking about one particular yeah. instance, but I, it can. I, I, I've, I've definitely had conversations with individuals in yeah. which um, a, a particular instance of, a, of what I would call a racist interaction uh -huh. could be intellectualized to the point that yes. it no longer it, it invalidates how I felt. Yes. Well, that's so, that's, and that's yeah. And that's what I mean. I definitely I, I appreciate yeah. that we treat it at the, yeah. that we treat it intellectually as well as emotionally. But yeah. my fear is then how do we how do we engage the two without yeah. invalidating the, those visceral effects? Well, I mean, I think that's what the poem illustrates that the that the young man is is saying no. You know, we we know that that race is wrong. You know, we know that there's no such thing as race in this way that you. You know, so why don't you just get over it? And what she's saying is, because racism is not purely, you know, is not intellectual. I cannot reason these. So basically, I think what we have to do is always have that dialectic. You know, you can go and describe it. One can describe and say, yes, I understand this. But this is how it makes me feel. Now, at the same time, it, you know, when we feel something, that in and of itself is not the, I would never say that that should end the conversation. You know, and sometimes people use experience that way. Well, that's my experience. You know, um, well, yes, yes. So it's, it's got to be a dialectic. You know, we have to work at it. It's not easy. But, um, you know, sometimes people will do that, and you have to bring them back. So I, I don't think there's a, you know, a particular way other than to just work at it. Yes? Um, I was wondering if there were any techniques that you had or uh, approaches for dealing with um, um, situations with students where you're challenging their biases and prejudices, but yet you're not having them lose face in front of their peers, or also um, scaring them or challenging them so much that they don't want to come back and maybe drop the class or don't engage with you after that point. If, is there anything that you do specifically? Well, it's, no. it's, it's very hard. Um, I, you know, you can usually tell when a student is turning off to you. And so sometimes what I'll do is, is try to engage them outside the classroom. I, I, I think it's a very bad idea to, to humiliate a student. Or I mean, you know, uh, the only time that I will react harshly is if a student has attacked me, which happens, you know, not very often, but occasionally, in which case, you know, I... I come back because I've got to keep authority in the classroom, and not not humiliating, but just you know uh, to keep my position. Uh, but no, so I will sometimes engage them outside the classroom, and um, and I also understand that we're just not going to touch everybody. So you sort of you sort of aim for a lot of them. You know? <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh -huh. with several faculty talking about teaching over one's career yes. and how it changes. Uh -huh. And I'm curious, you haven't been, been teaching for decades, yes. but you've been teaching for a while now between yes. grad and, and are there things that are getting easier? Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, getting up in front of the classroom is much <laughs> easier. You know, I remember my first uh, quarter, I often, I often tell people this, I, you know, I was here at Stanford and I was teaching a lecture course and I would walk, every day I would walk from my office to the lecture uh, hall and I would just, I had this mantra, I know more than they do, I know more than they do, I know more than they do. You know, um, and, and you know, at this point, I, I really do know more than they do. I, there, I, there is, you know, I mean, I have learned a lot in the last 12 years, just stuff, you know. Uh, I've read more, I, you know, so. So that's much easier. Um, the other thing is that um, I'm, I'm less nervous. I know I can do it. I, I, know how, I know how to conduct a discussion. You know, I know how to bring everybody in. I know how to, well, I mean, I've learned, for instance, not to speak too quickly. You know, that is a very hard thing. You know, you get up there and you're nervous and you just, you know. So I've learned to uh, make my talks shorter than they're supposed to be. Like you said, uh, 40 to 50 minutes. So, um, you know, I, I read at the level rate of about um, two, two minutes a page. So I made sure that it wasn't a 20 page talk, but like a 17 or 18 page talk. Because then, if I, something occurs to me, I can look up and say it. 
you know, so, so uh, uh, things get, it definitely gets easier. I don't know if that gives, answers your question. So. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> as I say. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.